So let's talk about our sampling approach. So what you have to first start out with is what's the objective of the audit test? Right? Are you testing controls or are you testing account balances? Right? And then the importance with this is because you have to be able to identify what constitutes an exception. Right? If the objective of your test, again, is to test that the ca cash disbursements are you know, valid, that they actually occurred, right? then you want to look at things, as I said, purchase order, receiving report, and vendor invoice. Right? So you want to test that that control is operating. If those documents are missing, that's an exception. So you have to be able to identify what is the objective of my test. If I'm testing operating effectiveness of internal controls, then these are the kinds of attributes that exist for this particular control. And if those attributes are missing, then I have an exception. So clearly state the objective of your audit test. Decide whether audit sampling applies. So in that case, audit sampling applies. Right? If you're testing the effectiveness of operating controls, then <coughs> audit sampling applies because you're going to look at a uh, you know, number of transactions and controls and see if those controls are being met, right? or, um, or if th to ensure that there are no breakdowns in internal controls. Right? So you want to be able to identify where there might be exceptions. So you're going to make or draw a conclusion from that sample about the effectiveness uh, in, in terms of the operation of that particular control. If your audit objective is to look at high risk accounts receivable balances, then sampling might not be the appropriate approach, right? Then you would look to non-statistical. You wouldn't go to, I'm sorry, you wouldn't sample. So sampling doesn't work in that case because you want high, you don't want every other high risk. You want to look at, if your objective is to look at all high risk accounts receivable, then that's not that's not the approach you're going to use, right? You're going to, sampling is not the approach you're going to use. You're going to look at 100% of those items. You're going to identify what constitutes a high risk accounts receivable, and then you're going to select all those accounts receivables that meet that criteria. So again, the importance of deciding whether or not audit sampling applies. <coughs> Define what attributes and exception, the attributes and exception conditions. So and what we mean here is, if you're testing, again, attributes, uh, testing attributes is a test of internal controls. So you have to define the attributes of that control, right? Going back to the disbursement problem example, it, the attributes that I look for, as the auditor will look for, would be a three-way match. So you look for all three of those documents. If you're testing uh, occurrence with respect to the sales and collection cycle, or you're testing uh, then you would look to see that a shipping document supports the uh, items recorded in the sales journal. So again, you select a sample of items from the sales journal and ensure that a shipping document is included or supports that, that uh, uh, item in the sales journal. Right. And so by setting the attributes, then that tells you then you're, you should be able to identify the exception if those attributes are missing. So if, if there's no shipping document, that's an exception. If there's no purchase order or voucher package with those three items, uh, a purchase order, receiving report, and uh, vendor invoice, that's an exception. So again, that's under, as you're going through this process of understanding your client's internal controls, you're identifying what attributes make up those controls. Okay, and if those attributes are not there, then that's an exception. Uh, define the population. This is where completeness is extremely important. So if you're looking at sales, the population would be the, all sales recorded in the sales journal. If you're looking at cash disbursements, all disbursements recorded in the cash disbursements journal. So you want to reconcile that you have all of the information or all of the transactions that occurred for sales or all of the transactions that occurred for cash disbursements. 
uh, to find what the sampling unit is. And that must be consistent with your audit objective. So if your audit objective, again, is to test the currents and controls over the recording of sales transactions, then your sampling unit, right, you're going to start with the sales journal, right? Because you want to know that sales are valid. Right? Your audit objective is to test that the, the sales recorded are valid, that they actually occurred. So you're going to start with the, the sampling unit of the sales journal, and you're going to get documentation to support that, shipping documents to support that sales are valid. If your sampling, if your audit objective is to test cash disbursements, and that cash disbursements are valid, you're going to, again, your sampling unit is going to be from your cash disbursement journal, and you're going to get documentation to support, look at the documentation to support that disbursements were only recorded after this three-way match occurred. Okay? Um, specify your tolerable rate of deviation. And what this means is you have to decide, and this is where, so sampling involves judgment on the auditor's part. And you as the auditor have to decide how much deviation you're willing to accept. So what's your acceptable uh, rate of, uh, of exceptions? Right? So if you want, if you believe or you're satisfied that 90, with 95% uh, of the transactions being recorded in accordance with the firm's um, control policies, that means you're willing to accept the 5%. Your tolerable rate of deviation is 5%. You're willing to accept that in your, your sampling. And that, again, is a uh, judgment that firms will have guidelines on that. And, you know, so it's not like you have to kind of pull this number out of your head. Like, oh, I feel like 5% today, right? That's not good. Right? So firms will have uh, guidance on that in terms of what, what would be uh, uh, suggestions for tolerable deviation rates. Um, and, uh, you know, you as an auditor or your would have to decide if you're going to deviate from that or not, right? But you have to document that. So obviously we want to specify, we should be willing to specify a low tolerable rate of deviation. You certainly wouldn't want to uh, be willing to tolerate a 50% rate of deviation. That's not going to give you a lot of comfort in your findings. And specify the acceptable risk of assessing control risk too low. Again, what are you willing to accept? What risk are you willing to accept that you have assessed internal control risk too low? Right? Because if you've assessed internal control risk too low, that means that you are over-relying. Right? So what amount of risk are you willing to accept? Same thing as the tolerable deviation rate. And you'll see that there are tables. When we go through this, we'll talk about the tables. Right? There are AICPA tables that it usually see 5% and 10%. Estimate what the population exception rate is, right? So you expect that there's going to be some, um, a pop, you know, some exception rate based on prior experience, um, based on what you know about uh, the, the client, right? And, and testing inter internal controls from the prior period. And then you estimate what that population exception rate is so that you know that there's some built in, that there's going to be some exceptions. From that, you determine the initial sample size. And you can use this, again, this is where the tables come in, the AICPA tables you plug in. We'll go through some examples where you plug in these uh, criteria, and then that gives you what your sample size should be. So that's your planning your sample. Now you have to go ahead and actually perform the audit procedures and select your sam the sample. Again, if you're looking at sales journals, right, if you're testing sales and controls over sales, then you're, you're going to look at uh, items in the sales and collection cycle, such as the sales journal, shipping documents. So you're going to select the sample and perform your audit procedures on that sample. And typically what you'll see is that you'll select a sample and you'll perform several audit procedures on that sample. Right? So think about um, if, you, if you select a sample of sales from the sales journal, right, you can test occurrence with that. You can test um, uh, accuracy with that. You can test cutoff to a certain extent with that. Right? So you, you can s perform several audit procedures on that one sample. 
Once you have selected your sample and performed your audit procedures, you have to evaluate the results of your, your testing. Right? And you have to determine um, what are my exceptions, analyze those uh, uh, exceptions, and you have to extend that back, those you know, generalize that to the entire population. And what does that mean? And think about whether or not, okay, is there, can I accept this? Right? But when I, uh, when I uh, extrapolate that back or generalize that back to the entire population, then I have to decide on the acceptability of these results considering the entire population. And then an auditor decides, well, can I, you know, does this tell me that there's material misstatement? Do I need to go back and do more work, uh, gather more, uh, a larger sample? Uh, that's the auditor's decision or judgment. Um, we'll talk about variables.